text this morning is Ephesians chapter 4, 25 to 32, in a message that I've entitled, Building a Healthy Church. So when we look at this scripture, we see Paul making an appeal to the Ephesians. And when we become a new creature in Christ, born again in our spirits, with a new walk and a new direction. Before we came to Jesus, uh, all of us walked in an old nature, in our old nature. And, and we were bound like slaves to a rebel character, given over to our nature's whims and doing what is wrong. And Paul reminds us in, in Ephesians chapter 2, Verses 1 and 3, and I know we've spoken about this before, but I'm just going to read this tidbit here again because it's so important to understand for the context of what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. Ephesians 2, verses 1, and th- 1 to 3 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and, uh, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work, and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath. We see that at work all around us, and we who have come to Jesus and have been forgiven and have been renewed, we, we think back and we can remember that life before we came to Christ, the darkness that enveloped us. But through faith in Jesus, it's awesome today to be able to say that that old nature under Adam is placed with it something eternal, something incorruptible, marked with holiness and righteousness. You see, we died to our old self, and our new self has been born again in the Spirit. A new character in Christ is born as the Holy Spirit enters the spirit of the believer. Paul encourages the Ephesians to pursue living in this new character which has been given to them by God, to put off the old rags of the nature described by Paul in Ephesians 2 that I just read, which we inherited from Adam, and to put on the new robes of righteousness given to us by Jesus to wear, to be clothed in holiness and doing the right things from a heart that is thankful and in love with God. So leading up to our text today, Ephesians 4.24, um, last week we ended with that, Paul reminded his audience that because they had been taught about the truth in Jesus and had been made new in Christ, there was now a new way of thinking to embrace. Sometimes people form habits, and God is in the, in the business of breaking habits that have been formed that are destructive. Now, when we come to Christ, we're justified, made just as if we had never sinned. There is a moment when we come to Him where the illumination of the Spirit comes inside and we're also sanctified to a certain extent. But the sanctification process, being conformed to the image of Christ, is not something that is done once and for all. See, when we come to Christ, it becomes a new thing that God does. And He begins to conform us to Christ. And we see this as we yield to the Holy Spirit, as we walk in our Christian lives. We see Him changing us, changing our perspectives, taking old things that we used to do and throwing them in the trash and giving us new ways of approaching things, new ways of looking at things. See, salvation begins with repentance. And repentance is a changing of the mind. The whole outlook of a person who's experienced genuine salvation through Christ Jesus changes. 
as that person places their trust in the Lord. Now, think back to the unsaved mind. The whole way of thinking of an unsaved person is futile because their whole being is darkened by sin's deception. Sin is deceitful. Rebellion against God and, and His standards and the, and the ways that He has set as good. Rebellion against that is, is, is very dark. It leads to no substantial purpose. And because that person does not know their Creator, they cannot truly understand the world around them that their Creator has intended for them to understand it in the way that He in, intended for them to understand it. Nor can any unsaved person truly understand themselves and how they fit into this world. But when we surrender our lives to Jesus, He puts our old life in the trash and He makes a brand new you. Not superficially new, but new to the very core of your being. Now, in verse 24, leading to what I have to talk to you about today, there's a word in the Greek talking about being made new. Kanos. Kanos is the expression of newness, as, as though it is just newly made. There's nothing like it, actually. It's new, and it, it is unique. Jesus, you see, hasn't just made kind of, you kind of new. He has done something new and unique inside of you by the Holy Spirit. All things have been made new. In verse 24, leading to the text today, Paul encourages believers to put on the new man. Put on the new man. This canos, this new, unique person, this newness. So with putting on the new man, there is a corresponding laying down of the old. Putting down the old man, putting the old way of doing things aside. Since we are made new and have this new man to put on. It's not just window dressing. God's not interested in superficial smiles and window dressing. He is interested in character change to the very core of an individual so that when, when one looks and reacts to the world around them, looks at and reacts to the world around them, they look at and react to the world around them in a way that Jesus would look at and react to the world around them. That's what he's interested in forming in his children. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And, and there's provision in the spirit of the living God to live in a way that pleases Jesus. So, in Ephesians 4.25, Paul says this. He says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. You know, Jesus promised his disciples that they would find new life in him. But to experience this new life, we must be willing to walk in step with him. We must be willing to set aside the old habits and to lose the old way of doing things. Why? Because we love him and we want to follow him and we want to live for him. And in doing in, in having that desire. The old things, God wants them to become less appealing to us. Yeah, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted by the old person, the old man, the old lady inside. You, there's going to be that. But God is with you. Now, Jesus said something about this in Luke 9, 24 and 25. He says this. He says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. For what good is it for someone to gain the world, yet to forfeit or lose their very self or lose their soul? Because we have received truth from Jesus that has set us free. You have been set free in Christ. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've been set free from the slavery of sin that had you captive before that. You are no longer a captive to sin. Therefore, 
Paul is encouraging people to live in accordance with the new character that Christ has implanted in them. And this is why Paul starts in verse 25 um, by talking about truth and lies. Really, he's talking about lies, but he's talking about the corresponding truth that he wants to embrace on the flip side of that. So Paul's recognized the truth that was to be lived in Jesus, and as such, the lie that we lived before we came to relationship with God needs to be rejected. So this is why Paul starts in verse 25 by saying that he who has come to Christ must put off falsehood. The power of God. The power of God does not leave us like orphans without help. We can't do this alone. You think you can put your old nature down on your own? On your own? You're mistaken. You can't do it. But the power of Christ in you will put down that old nature. And Paul's like, yield to that, friends. Yield to this. The power of God is available to help us to live holy and pure lives. And the start of it is by rejecting the lie. Put off falsehood. The power of God is able to help us to be truthful. It's the same today as it was in the ancient world, isn't it? Human nature hasn't changed. Ever since the fall and Adam and Eve fell into sin, human nature has continued the same way. <laughs> when you look around at, at the world that we live in, right, we've been raised and, and we've been conditioned to lie. And, and even though people speak against it, really there is all this stuff going on behind the scenes. Lies. Lies everywhere. The temptation to lie is not just restricted to lawyers. Right? It's not. They have a strong temptation to lie, right? But it's not just restricted to them, the temptation, or politicians, or maybe the unregenerate guy that lives across the street from you on your block, you know, that uh, you could go, oh, man. <laughs> Hi, neighbor. What the fuck do you want? Oh, God. Have mercy. What? You know, like, this is the kind of world we live in. There's angry people. There's angry people. There's people that are trying to survive in this world without hope, without Christ. That is, that is how it is out there. And lies are told when they're convenient and people can, um, can, can get what they want. All right? So the temptation, yeah, it's not just with, uh, with certain people. You have temptations to lie, too. We have the propensity to lie. Who here hasn't lied in their life? Oh, my. I'm praying for you, brother. <laughs> well, as the Scripture says that if anyone claims they're without sin, the truth is not in them, right? It's, we, are, we have this propensity to go that way. Romans 6, 6 and 7, Paul tells us this. He says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So if you're saved and you know Christ, he's given you the power to be an overcomer and to, to cut the ties with the old habits and to be conformed to the image of Christ. As new creations in Christ, we have a choice. We can follow the old ways. Yeah, we can choose to do that. Or we can yield to this new nature born in us by the Spirit of the living God who lives in us. Since the Holy Spirit, what does He desire? He desires unity with His people. He desires purity within His people. <laughs> Telling lies... It breaches relational closeness, doesn't it? When lies are told, there's always a relationship that is breached. There's a, a relational closeness that, that breach is breached, and it also leads to disunity. In Ephesians 3 and 4, Paul emphasized how important it is for Jesus, to Jesus, for his church, to pursue brotherly love and unity. Paramount importance. It's important to God. 
And it's within the context of unity in Ephesians 4.25 that Paul speaks to us putting falsehood aside, to be truthful with one another, to lay aside falsehood. What he's saying, actually, is that we belong to each other, right? When you lie to other people, you're not just harming yourself, you're harming everyone else around you. And Paul's pleading to be obedient to the call of our new master, the Holy Spirit, who compels us to be holy peacemakers. We can't, we can't have this if we reject truth, embrace lies, and practice deception. In order to really have unity in the Holy Spirit within our relationships, within our homes, and within our churches, we're called to yield to the will of the Holy Spirit who compels us to be righteous and not legalistically righteous as though somehow that's going to gain you more stead with God. Jesus Christ died for your sins and that's, that's what makes you right with God. It's not anything else. None of your works makes you righteous before God. Even your works themselves, their good works are like filthy rags to God. What He desires is you to come to Him and acknowledge that you need Him. Acknowledge that you need His grace. You're saved because God's grace has been poured out on you, not because you deserve it. None of us deserve God's grace, but nevertheless, He gives it to us freely. See, the love of God compels us to reject falsehood. He compels us. If you listen to that Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of you, He's going to tell you to tell the truth and to be truthful. And that, you see, it's important for us to tell truth because we are all members of one body. Do you think that's kind of interesting that He put it there? Deception and lying to one another breaks unity. We're all members of one body. He wants us to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to a world that's dying and that desperately needs to see truth. Not just see truth through our lips, but see truth through the way we handle ourselves, for the, through the way that we treat one another. That's what the world needs to see. And that's what Jesus brings if we listen, if we yield to it. So the church is like a body. A body can only function if it tells itself the truth. Why, why do I mean that? Well, you're part of the body, so each of you are part of it, right? Not, we're not, it's not just me and not just that guy over there. Every one of you who believe is part of the body. So let's say if your hand touches something hot, but your hand tells your brain that that thing is cool, what's going to happen? Well, your hand's going to be severely burned, isn't it? See, sometimes this has happened in the church of Christ. And that's why Paul's bringing this up. He says, brothers, this ought not to be. God desires us to work together in holiness and purity and to put off falsehood with one another and to tell truth. So from truthfulness, he moves to the next issue of anger. Now, anger in itself is, is not wrong. No. Anger by itself isn't wrong. Huh. But Paul does make it clear that anger can become a, a significant entry point for sin. In verse 26 and 27, our text says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. There is such a thing as righteous anger. God is righteously angry sometimes. We see that in Scripture. Now, we can be angry at the injustices that we see around us. Yeah. And it's not wrong to be. We can be angry when innocent people are hurt. We can be angry when our Christian witness has been tainted, when other believers make bad decisions. We can be angry when we see how the world treats our Lord with contempt and disrespect. Angry when we're betrayed by someone that we thought we could trust angry when our name is smeared without justifiable cause. We can even be angry with ourselves when we mess up, right? Well, righteous anger is not wrong. Righteous anger 
can lead us to do the right thing. But Paul tells us when someone or something makes us angry that we have to be very careful here not to sin. See, anger is so easily led into sin if we're not careful and prayerful. You know, this is why the Bible says that we should pray without ceasing because we need the grace of God and the power of the Spirit of God to, to help us in those times when everything just seems out of control. Because He can bring control to that. Anger is one of those triggers, right, that can send things out of control. So, in context of Ephesians, Paul is emphasizing that anger, which turns sinful, hurts the church. It breaks the unity of the bond of peace amongst brethren. It gives the devil a foothold to reduce our effectiveness as ambassadors and partners in the gospel. Now, there's several ways that anger can lead to sin if not handled correctly. And other places in the New Testament speak to this issue as well. Um, for example, James says this in James chapter 1, 19 and 20. He says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So, one obvious sign that anger has turned to sin is uh, when we start attacking the wrongdoer rather than attacking the problem at hand. Now, the first pe way people sin when they're angry is to blow up, right? <laughs> ah, rage. <laughs> blow up. When we let our anger lead us to the boiling point, things break loose, we lose our tempers, saying things that we shouldn't be saying, doing things that we shouldn't be doing. When I've lost my temper, I've lost control. I say, I, I mean personally, right? I've said things to people in anger and done things that I should never have done, that I should never have said. <laughs> I'd like to take those things back, but I can't. I have to ask for forgiveness. But the damage has been done. You guys know what I'm talking about because you've had the same experiences, right? So blowing up is the way that anger becomes sinful. The second way that we might sin when we're angry is to stir things up. So you can blow up and you can stir up. Well, stirring things up. Well, rather than facing the source of our anger head on and trying to work out a direct solution, we sin when we go away and we begin to speak about it with other people. And it's always a good idea for us to go to the place where that has caused our anger, or to the person that has caused our anger. And to sit down with that person or party that has angered us. When it, when it comes to controversial issues, there's so many out there. There's so many different views on things, right? Sometimes, when we get angry, when we hear something, we automatically trigger to where our last experience with this issue was. We tr it takes us back. And we began to make assumptions in anger that might just be incorrect. Maybe we've interpreted this whole scenario that's taken place wrongly. We need to give room for clarification and, and apology. If apology is warranted, if clarification is warranted, we need to give room for these things. But if we start to stir up behind the scenes the carnage that results. My goodness, churches have been destroyed by this. Families have been destroyed by this. We can't afford to sin by becoming a stirring up person, to stir it up. Stirring up leads to a lot of divisions in the church really does. Because when you stir up, the person or the, the party isn't there to speak to it. So it's all one side, and it could be a one side that's got it completely wrong. 
So resist the temptation to stir it up. The final way that people are tempted to sin when they're angry is to clam up. I, this one isn't spoken about very often. Sometimes we, you know, that saying, the gentle answer turns away wrath. People take that to an extreme. And when they're angry, they just zip it right up and they don't say anything. They just zip it up and they sit back, they stand back. And it begins to turn and boil within, but they don't say anything. It's just quiet seething that takes place. Well, I want you to know this, that, that that's sinful because it, it forms bitter roots within you. Climbing up is also a sure way to lead us to depression. Because rather than dealing with our anger in a healthy way, in a way that glorifies God, we begin to resent the thing or the person that is or who has offended us. We begin to imagine that person as being someone maybe that's far worse than the offense that has occurred. And it could be that that person sinned in a moment and they need the opportunity to repent and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. But if we clam up, we're not giving that person that. We create a monster inside of our heads of that person. It creates distance. It creates coldness. It creates self-focus where we're thinking about how terrible we've been offended We begin to nurse our wounds and feel sorry for ourselves. Really, the problem becomes a hundred times bigger when we do this. A hundred times bigger than it needs to be. That may be something that's significant and, and big, but when we do that, it creates it into a bigger scenario. If we want to be obedient and honoring to our Savior when we get angry, the bottom line is this, friends. We must tread carefully. We really do. We need to tread carefully. Our flesh, our flesh is going to go to the default, to the old nature, right? And each one of us does it differently. Maybe you're prone to blow up. Maybe you're prone to stir up. Maybe you're prone to clam up. All of these things, you see, if they're not done right, if you're not, if you don't handle that right, it's going to create division. It's going to create disunity in the church, in your home, in your relationship with your spouse or your children or whatever, or the people that are across the street from you. In a way that we need to learn how to handle our anger in a way that's pleasing to God. In verse 28, Paul continues. He says, Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Again, you see this? Did you, did you just get that last part there? We see the apostles' heart speaking to the believers about stealing, which is breaching the seventh of the Ten Commandments, right? We see him speaking about it, But the context is that if you steal and you don't learn to to work for what you get, really, you're not fulfilling the mission of Christ. And what is the, uh, the mission of Christ? To seek and to save the lost, right? To 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 serve, not to be served. So being Putting, putting our hands to the plow and, and working with what God has given us enables us to help other people and to help each other, right? Like, like as a church, but other people out there. This pleases the Lord. So stealing, again, you know, Christ clothed us in new robes of righteousness. Everything changed, changes. If you've got a habitual habit of stealing, that needs to drop off. Why? Because you love the Lord. And you want Him to be glorified in you. And you want to be close to Him. And you want to be close to others. And you don't want the breach that could occur when stealing is at, as at, as at play. When you steal, 
you're damaging trust. You're damaging... Re- who likes... Who has ever had their place broken into? Your car broken into? The church here, my goodness. We've had several break-ins, you know, where our, someone's broken and stolen all our gas cans and, you know, stolen a weed eater and on it goes, you know. Like, it just makes you feel violated. See, as, as, a, as a believer in Christ, as a new p- creation in Christ, we're not in the business of violating people. We're in the business of building people up. That's the character of Christ. And Paul says, you've got that character because the Holy Spirit lives in you. So just let your habits drop off. Seek Him. Look to Him and old things will pass away. So if you're stealing, you must steal no longer. Work with your hands. Why? Because you want to, pr- you want to um, uh, be a part of giving to other people. That pleases the Lord. He continues, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only for what is helpful for building others up in according, in accor- according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Again, you see the context? Unwholesome talk and the connection point of other-centeredness? See, some people say, oh, doesn't God just want you guys just to lighten up? Come on, man. What's, what's wrong with a little bit of cursing? Like, you know, you get frustrated and you curse. and The odd coarse joke makes people laugh. It lightens everything up around you. So what's the big deal? Well, Paul tells it like it is here. Unwholesome talk of any kind. It's out of line with the children of God. Cursing ruins your witness for Jesus. It dishonors God. And, and James backs up Paul, Paul, what Paul says here in James 3.10, which says, out of the same mouth come praising and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Many Christian people, I dare say, have a hard time hearing the voice of God speaking to them. And this is because because they're conforming to the pattern of this world and they're dull to the voice of the Spirit because their heart has been hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Don't be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Even as a believer, yeah, you're, you're saved, but you can distance yourself in your relationship with God. You can distance yourself in the relationship that God desires you to have with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can put distance there by yielding to the old man, to the old lady. Don't conform, Romans 2.12 says this, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How is your mind renewed? It's renewed by God. It's renewed by His Word speaking to you. You know, blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the mocker. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which brings forth fruit in its season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. That's a scripture we learned as kids. Memorize. Mom made us memorize that. You know, that, that, that's true. Like when... when when we allow ourselves to be sitting in the council of, of unrighteousness, in the seat of unrighteousness, our, our life is going to wither. We're not going to be like a flourishing tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in its season. What is the fruit that God desires to bear in your life, in my life? What is this fruit? It's the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness. The Scripture des- describes what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. All these things, there are, that's what God desires to be hanging heavy from the branches of His children. The branches of your, your life is like a, a tree. And, and the facets of your life are like branches. Yeah, we've been trimmed pretty hard, haven't we, over the last couple of years. God's pruned us. 
pruned us individually, corporately. He's pruned us. Why? Because he loves us and he wants to, to bear much fruit, the fruit of righteousness. He desires for his church to have the fruit of righteousness hanging heavily from the fruit, from the branches. You are part of the church. You are, you are the church. God desires the fruit of righteousness to be hanging heavy from the branches of your life. So, with cursing, it doesn't lift anyone up. It doesn't lift you up. It brings people down. It makes people feel yuck, dirty. Ugh. No, that's not God's desire. He doesn't want us to have that ugh feeling. Right? I'm not saying that if our faith is all feelings, but there is a litmus test. When you do wrong, your conscience speaks because the Spirit of God goes, hey, that's, that's not cool, man. What you just did there, that's not cool. Oh. Be sensitive in your conscience. Listen to that. God's speaking. So, furthermore, when we're cursing, if we develop a habit of cursing, how are we going to explain that to our children and to the children around us in our church, right? Children love to repeat what they hear from adults, don't they? Be careful careful, friends, because God's given you everything you need to live a way that is pleasing to Him. But you must watch your life and your doctrine closely. Be careful that you're not deceived into thinking, oh, yeah, because I have grace, I can do what I want. No, it doesn't work that way. Because, you, you, because you're given grace, You've been given the opportunity to be like Jesus, to be holy, not to get away with whatever your old nature says. Yeah, God will forgive you. That's true. If anyone sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness, but his desire is not that we walk in the ways of the flesh, but that we walk in the ways of the Spirit so that others would be benefited, so that we can build others up, and so that we can glorify God, and, and our lives become uh, a, a, a song of worship. Our life song is a song of worship to Him. Paul continues saying, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, as human beings, there's many ways that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to us, by the way, as God's mark of ownership over us. You know, Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, guess what? When you're cleansed by the blood of Christ, when you accept Jesus as your Savior and you believe, the blood is applied to your life, the sins are swept away, cast away as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. We can get excited about that. But the clean place now that has been swept clean by the, by the blood of Christ has been made for one thing, and that is that the Spirit of the living God could make His residence within you so that you could be at one with God. That's what atonement is about, at one meant, so that the Spirit of the living God is, is united in you, in your spirit. So don't grieve Him. Don't grieve Him. Why? Because we love Him. We don't want to hurt him. Get out. We're sealed by the Spirit for the day of redemption. That's how we know that we are the children of God, because the seal of the Spirit is upon us. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you haven't come to salvation, my friends. Those who have come to salvation have been given the Spirit of Christ as a seal. I think... He was given to us, right? To help us to navigate through this world and to lead us to the eternal life that he promises. And I think the Holy Spirit is grieved when we're finding time for everything else but him. 
when our lives are so full with so many hours to spare for relaxation and amusement, but our Bible remains unread on a shelf somewhere when we actively pursue worldly things but have no time to connect with God in prayer. I think the Lord is grieved when He sees that we have come to love everything else better than we love Him. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we actively disobey and when we sin. He knows how continuing to sin when, we set, when we're set free will lead to broken communion with Him and how He's going to have to correct us for our own good. Now, many of you here this morning are parents or grandparents, but when you think back to your parenting years, if you're older or if you're in the middle of this, right? Now, as a father, I've been very grieved when my children pursued behaviors that were destructive, right? Where they weren't right and they needed correction. I've been grieved by that. I don't know about you, but you know, when you love your kids and you see them doing things that are harmful to others or harmful to themselves, it, it deeply grieves you. And it, and it leads to necessary corre- corrections. Now, as a dad, I, I would much rather bless my children and give them a gift, then I would discipline them. I would. I've taken no pleasure in administering discipline. But over the years, I've done it to try and help them come to terms with bad decisions that they're making for their own good. As an earthly father, I did this imperfectly. I did it as I thought best, and sometimes I didn't do it the right way. And I look at that, and I go, oh, man, you know, if I would have done it a different way, it would have been better. But the Holy Spirit does exactly the right thing for us in exactly the right measure, in exactly the right time for our own good. What's going to invoke God's discipline on us as His children? Well, He'll discipline us when He sees us acting foolishly, yielding to the temptations of the old nature. You can be sure if we find ourselves harboring bitterness against other people when we're wronged, when we rage and anger against people in our circumstances, um of rage and anger lead us to sin like we've described. How do you sin when you're angry? Well, we ra- when we rage and anger against people and we sin, when we embrace the spirit of fighting <clears throat> and gossip mm, about other people behind their back who are walking the same pathway as us, and when we get acting malicious and mean Towards our fellow man, we yield to that temptation to get even and to, and to get the last dig in. Rather than giving them some grace, just as God gave us grace. When this happens, and haven't we all messed up in these ways? All of us, really, if we're honest, we're messing, we mess up in these ways sometimes. Join the club. But when we stray from God's ideal, He's not just going to just let it go. No. As a father, when you see that in your biological kids that you're raising, you're not just going to let it go if you love them or you shouldn't because that brings on itself in a whole other problem. Then you have issues that are deeper and bigger. No. You're going to deal with it. You're going to provide discipline. And the Heavenly Father is a perfect Father, so He knows exactly what's needed to discipline you the right way. So if you're, those things that I've just described here, if you're tempted to do those things and you yield to them, guess what? You're going to come under the discipline of God. God's going to discipline you. I don't know how He's going to discipline you. I don't know what's going to happen to bring you discipline so that you turn from that pattern of behavior, but God will not let you get away with it, you are going to face a consequence. Why? Because your Heavenly Father loves you too much 
to let you just get away with it. So, consider what the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 48. I'm just going to read this passage because it speaks for itself. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have completely, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? I like that. This word of encouragement that addresses you as a father or addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what child is not, or what children are not disciplined by their father. And if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Speaks for itself, doesn't it? So when we enter hardship, Lord, you're the great physician. You're the great adjuster. Take this, whatever is happening here, and use it to make my character more like you. I'm sorry, there's something, Lord, that maybe I, I see here that just needs to go. So, God, I, I just, I thank you. I thank you for this trouble because I know that you're using it for your glory. I don't understand and I, maybe I don't even know right now what it is. And that's not always that trouble is discipline. I'm just saying that trouble can be discipline. Sometimes the rain just falls. Sometimes in this world our bodies deteriorate, things fall apart. There's things that just happen in the natural scale that have nothing to do with this. But there are times where God disciplines us different ways. Just keep that in mind. Who wants to go undergo corrective discipline? I know I don't. That's why Paul's talking to the Ephesians. He doesn't want them to have to experience the loving hand of discipline of God because it does hurt. He wants them to learn by observing the word, and by being doers, hearers of the word and doers of the word. And this is why he says, rather than this taking place here, rather than pursuing all these terrible things that are really going to end up with you under the hand of discipline of God, rather, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, Instead of being malicious and mean, let that go. Forgive. Be kind and compassionate and instead, forgiving each other, just as God and Christ forgave you. And in ending, in context with the gift that Jesus has given us as his church, God desires we dispense the same kind of mercy and grace towards others that he dispensed to us. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer?